Electricast. What do tigers dream of when they take a little tiger snooze? Do they dream of mauling zebras or Halle Berry in her Catwoman suit? Don't you worry, pretty striped head, we're gonna get you back to Tyson and your cozy tiger bed. And then we're gonna find our best friend Doug, and then we're gonna give him a best friend hug. Doug, Doug, oh, Doug, 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 Doug. But if he's been murdered by crystal meth tweaker. Shit out of luck. Um, totally ad libbed. Both songs in the film. Totally ad libbed. Both songs. Because we're, we're the three, three best friends that anybody could, could have. have. We're the three best friends that anyone could have. We're the three best friends that anyone could have. And we'll never, ever, 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 ever leave each other. Oh. What up, and welcome to Or Whatever Movies. I'm your co host, Iris, and I'm with my older brother, Wesley. And today we are talking about my favorite movie of all time, 2009, The Hangover. Oh, man. Okay. I'm going to tell you, Wes, why this is not only my favorite movie, but it's also kind of a perfect movie. Director of Joker, Todd Phillips, The Hangover? Yes. Who made about a gazillion, bazillion dollars off this film, by the way. Yeah. And two sequels. You love those equally, right? No, we're just going to... We're going to proceed in a world where the sequels do not exist. Why taint the perfection that is The Hangover with sequels that were pure money grabs? I get it. You got to take, you got to strike while the iron's hot or whatever, but it doesn't take away from the original Hangover. So did you know this was the greatest movie ever the second you saw it? No, I did not. So I did see The Hangover in the theaters. I do remember enjoying it. I do remember the entire audience enjoying it. So that was kind of it. And then years later, we went to go see a film at the iPick theaters. You know, the ones with the reclining seats and all that? Yeah, where they you got a button and you're like, bring me popcorn. Exactly. And for whatever reason, they had some kind of promotion going. Maybe like buy gift certificates or something like that. Get a free DVD. And one of the DVD options was... The Hangover. And I was like, oh yeah, I remember liking that movie. And so that was my pick. And I took it home. And from there started the great love affair with The Hangover. Now granted, any movie that you come to know and love also corresponds with like a specific time in your life, right? So I was, it was 2009. I had just gotten out of grad school and maybe was hoping that my grad school experience would have yielded more professional results. And so I poured all of my disdain for filmmaking into watching The the Hangover over and over again. And it was like this comfort food that I just ate over and over and over again. I mean, The Hangover, the best thing about The Hangover is, for me, it's like hanging out with my friends. And people go on and on. They're like, Phil's such a dick and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I don't see that at all. Like, I see these as guys who are being real <laughs> with each other, who are fr- who are like genuine friends, and who, despite all the shenanigans, are really trying to do what's best, a.k.a. get Doug to the Chitrashan time. And also, Bradley Cooper. I am thankful for The Hangover, that it made Bradley Cooper the Bradley Cooper we now know and love. Completely different from The Hangover, Bradley Cooper. Completely different, but, you know, kind of just speaks to his versatility. I do think that The Hangover led Bradley Cooper to believe in himself in a way that allowed him to kind of fulfill his artistic potential. I'm glad that The Hangover has allowed Bradley Cooper to step into his own as a filmmaker, not only with likes of Star is Born or... um, American Sniper, your favorite Clint Eastwood movie. I'm I'm not dude, I'm not saying that I don't love Bradley Cooper. I love Bradley Cooper. He's a big part of why I like this film. And I'm also not blind to the fact that it's a little ironic that a movie like The Hangover is 
my favorite movie. And I lean into that a little bit. It's a little counterintuitive, but it doesn't mean that the film isn't good. I mean, I do have the sense of humor of an 18-year-old boy, and I blame a lot of that on you. You're welcome. If you watch it repeatedly, you didn't pick up any flaws whatsoever? It has flaws. It has scenes that fall flat. It has stuff that hasn't aged well. Every time I see the stun gun scene at the police precinct, whenever I see that scene, I'm like, really? Nah. I mean, it's a little... That was the answer. That was the compromise they made to have the charges dropped was to be assaulted in front of, ki- of in front of kids for comedic effect. Yeah, I mean, I totally get and buy that the it would have brought the police officers pleasure. But the fact that Stu doesn't hightail it out of that classroom the moment that he hears they're going to be tased is very out of character for him. And this is my thing with the film is like, so the hangover and watching the hangover was the beginning of my theory of character is consistency and the characters are wonderfully and beautifully consistent whether you like them or not they are through and through who they are from start to finish i will grant you that even Stu, who's the only character who really has an arc and that scene is inconsistent character wise i mean there are semblances of it Like, Stu is like, I'm not doing this. And then he gets tased from behind. And Phil is like, let's think about this rationally. You don't really want to do this. He's trying to use his powers of manipulation. But similarly, he allows himself to get tased in the the nuts. It overall isn't my favorite scene. Just like the Dan Band's appearance at the wedding feels unrealistic. And it's unnecessary how over the top his performance goes and how rude he is to the guests. It's well known that the best way to do comedy is to play the characters truthfully, right? And I feel like the actors do do that with these characters. And sometimes they're not always given the opportunity to in some of these more far-fetched kind of scenes. I'm With a possible exception of Mr. Chow and definitely the stun gun scene, um, they, this movie does kind of play it straight across the board and truthful and practical. Um, they are actually in Las Vegas. They're actually in Caesar's Palace. And it's not slapsticky in the sense that it feels like the characters are in on it. You know, like they're really in peril and really distressed pretty much the whole time. And really in the dark. Yeah, and they really play it that way even though obviously it's a ridiculous situation that they would walk in and Mike Tyson would be waiting to clock them after singing Phil Collins. <laughs> but isn't it just, isn't it wonderful to keep you on your toes? I don't know, man. I have automatic resistance. When people say that a movie that is obviously not the best movie ever created is the best, it's like the sneak maintaining that Troop Beverly Hills is the end-all be-all of American cinema. I have trepidation going in, so all I can see in The Hangover is the flaws. I will acknowledge that this is maybe the most ambitious, um, most authentic, most grounded frat bro comedy of all time. I mean, alone, it's a master class in blocking. There's not a single scene with less than three characters, most with many more. The Mike Tyson punching scene looks pretty good. I think that in sl- like slowed down or frame by frame, Zach takes that hit just a touch early. But for a non-actor like Tyson to throw a very real punch that had probably had to be blocked very carefully, it looks really good. It's <laughs> lightning fast, and and all and almost and Alan hits the floor almost before he's done swinging. It's shockingly <laughs> brutal. And it's known that Mike Tyson had to be coached by Todd Phillips on how to throw a cinematic punch. And he was like aghast. Mike Tyson was like aghast because he was like, the captain of the Jewish debate team is trying to tell me how to punch somebody. Yeah, it looked very real and it looked like it made real contact and it looked horrifying. (laughs) You know what did not look real or horrifying? As you can tell every time when that tiger is real and when it's not. Yeah. Because that tiger could not give one shit about anything that was going on when anybody wandered into that bathroom. Oh, he was there. He was behind glass, though. Yeah, but he could not care less. He wasn't menacing or threatening. Well, it's all the surprise effect, right? You know what always freaks me out is, I mean, clearly the tiger is being, like, driven by a handler 
by a, ra- a wildlife wrangler when they're leaving yep. Tyson's place in the uh, surveillance footage. Uh-huh. But I can't see how the other actors would have been protected from the tiger at that point. I can't see, yeah, like the pushing the car scene? Yeah, no, they could probably have some kind of partition in the within the car. And maybe he was chained up enough so that he couldn't come out that little side window and, and like, attack Alan. But, um, you know, clearly they were, it was safe in the bathroom both times Alan and Stu have to go in there. But the walking around scene, I think that they could have been in real and real potential peril. But they this is a very distinctly Vegas thing. If you watch The Tiger King, which I know you haven't, people use baby tigers all the time to seduce people. Even in, especially in Vegas. Did you say the Tiger King? Maybe. After you watched the the Tiger King, did you go to the Sizzlers <laughs> for an early bird dinner? Don't talk like you're some kind of authority on Tiger King. All right. So for this movie, I felt like while I will acknowledge that the characters were pretty consistent, Alan never felt real to me. It's hard to to recognize that dude as a real dude. Like he seemed like a legitimate retard. <laughs> retard. Which is also kind of dated. The the retard bit and the homophobia and Chow's performance are those are the things that haven't aged very well. But I would I would contest that Zach Galifianakis is very real in the sense that he is a character who just wants to be liked. Now he wants to be, he's a little misguided in the fact that he wants to be liked by people who are mean and is typically standoffish to people who are nice, but therein lies the comedy. But it's so strange. It's almost like an Andy Kaufman level of comedy. Is the Alan character ever actually funny or is it more cringy because of how sad he is and how he's so dumb that he can't even be insulted? He's not, cre- he's not creepy. He's just socially awkward. I mean, you should He's relate to that. He's not allowed within 200 feet of a school. Yeah, but we never get the backstory of that. I'm, I'm just doing whatever I can to defend Alan because he's a great character. Okay, so Zach Galifianakis is obviously, the Alan character is obviously the comic relief in this movie. Bradley Cooper, not known for his comedy. I think he does just fine as the douchey, good-looking bro dude that everybody has. He's basically the Vince Vaughn character in, in all the other Vince Vaughn movies, including Todd Phillips' Old School, which I think, <clears throat> unpopular opinion, is a funnier movie than The Hangover. Oh, I think Vince Vaughn even turned down the role of Phil. And, and so then you had the more stew like character, the straight man who was in uh, in Old School was uh, Luke Wilson. No. And, and this one is Ed Helms. Justin but, Barth is the straight man. Ed okay, Helms fine, is totally he's, up, uptight. But he's, he's, but he's absent for 90% of the movie. Yeah. And then in old school, you have Will Ferrell, who's untouchable in comedy. And Zach Galifianakis, while he may be a good stand-up, is no Will Ferrell in movies. He doesn't have the timing that pushes hangover to be consistently as funny as will smith who carries old school on his back will smith what will smith was in old school will ferrell <laughs> what are you talking about you said will smith you so basically you just said phil Stu, and alan are not funny well none of those guys are funny the situation is funny and and like when a naked guy hops out of the trunk and Kelly looks at me and says blankly, where was his penis? <laughs> that kind of stuff is funny. And circumstances are certainly funny. And I guess Mike Tyson is funny, even though he's scary and a convicted rapist. But the humor was more situational and less than any of those dudes were inherently funny. Well, it is it is situational in the sense that they're put in this impossible kind of situation. But it's also situational in the sense that these three guys who aren't necessarily friends, right? Stu and Phil do have a history, but you get the sense that they're more independent friends with Doug. They're literally the three best friends that anyone could have. Right, according to Alan, who wants nothing more in life than that to be true. But otherwise, they are three guys who are being thrown together in this circumstance, but only because of their associations with Doug. I mean, he's the guy who ties them all together and so the funny is supposed to come from this odd trio. And so I think the trio works because this is the iconic trio of The Hangover. 
and Hangover 2 and Hangover 3. But you remember when Will Byers disappeared and everybody else was looking for him? And then at the end, they finally get Will Byers back, even though he's not 100% all there. Spoiler, Stranger Things 1. Mm -hmm. Weren't you kind of resistant to Will being a full-fledged character member in subsequent seasons? <laughs> it's like, get out of here, dude. Come on, Doug, go back up on the roof. We're, we're, we want to hang with Alan and Stu and, and, and Douchebag. Well, yeah, well, he's not on. I mean, he is a prop once they find him on the roof. And then he similarly goes away in Hangovers 2 and 3, although I can't say I totally remember those films either. I mean, I most closely relate to Phil in this movie. And maybe I'm a dirtbag, but I kind of feel like he speaks the truth. And maybe he's not always real sensitive about his delivery, but he's also got this sense of confidence that everything's going to be all right, that they're going to work through what they've got to work through to get there. I mean, yeah, he's all, like, douchey, and you see in the photos that he's smacking strippers' asses and stuff like that. But he's also a family man, and he returns to his, to his kid to ask about the soccer game. Well... I think that the wife and kid were sort of platitudes that we were given so that we wouldn't think he was a jerk across the board. But while Phil was douchey and sort of offhand and flippant and didn't have much tolerance for people being stupid, um, he did have everyone's best interest at heart, right? He, there was no way that he was going to let anything happen to Doug or to Alan, that matter, who he was like, who the hell is this guy from the outset? Yeah, you know he he was Phil was the first one on the floor when Alan got clocked. We're like, why did you do that to Tyson? And he was also the one that didn't. He, instead of getting all pissed at Alan like Stu did when he finds out that they're drugged, you know he's got a way of seeing the bright side about of things. Like this is a good thing. Now we know that somebody didn't drug us for God knows what reason, and now we got to move forward together. Yeah, he was he was the least inhibited. I think he was the most in control, and like you said, the most honest for sure. But, uh, you know, given that, all that license and stuff and the fact that he's a good looking dude and, and can do whatever, he just, his personality goes unchecked, I guess, which kind of lends to, to douchiness. But the reason I identified with the Stu character is because I've been in Vegas where things are going down and I'm like, how do you do that and still consider this fun? The idea of a wild night of debauchery for a, a bachelor party is difficult for me to fathom because if I have more than one beer, I start to feel like crap. So I've often been the hand-holding, make sure you don't get eaten by a tiger kind of uh, designated driver type. It's hard for me to get on board and be like, that was awesome. Well, two but things. Two things. I'm seeing now that I'm much more of a bro dude than you. But also, you're talking about Stu like he's some kind of responsible guy. He was the craziest <laughs> wild bastard that the chapel guy ever saw in his life. Yep. And I think that that's what's funny and revealing and kind of wonderful about Stu. Uh, on the outside, he's this uptight, whipped dentist dude. But on the inside, and you see it revealed throughout the film, he's kind of a cool dude. Like, he doesn't like, he's offended initially that Alan is pretending that the baby is jacking off at brunch. <laughs> but he also kind of can't help but laugh. And he's also mean to Alan when Alan reveals that he drugged them. But he also feels really bad when he hits him with the car door. And like he's totally whipped but ready and willing to stand up to his would-be fiance once he kind of gets the courage which this adventure gives him. And he's a very talented musician. So you're relating to him like he's some kind of wrangler and like he keeps people in <laughs> check but i'm, just, <laughs> he I'm goes saying nuts. among the three i'm not adverse to fun for sure and honestly if i got blackout drunk i have no clue what would happen which is generally why i avoid getting blackout drunk because i know that i consider it a task that i perform dutifully when i have to pick people up and then clean the vomit off of the rental car door because we have less than a half an hour before we have to turn it in to get somebody on a flight so i don't know that anybody would do that for me oh i do it for you and I have had friends that have done it for me. So Todd Phillips has gone on to arguably better things in directing The Joker and what will inevitably be The Joker sequel, whatever that happens to be. But uh, Hangover, you can see the progression of his movies because uh, 
You know, Old School always stood out to me, mostly because that's one of my, my more favorite Will Ferrell roles. The Hangover seemed like this weird anomalous thing where, like we said, it's a giant movie wrapped up in a frat bro comedy that could have been told for half the budget and probably would have been arguably as successful. It was a pretty reasonable budget. But it was still a big movie in terms of like the ability just to film in Caesar's Palace is kind of a big deal. And they went with it with tigers and 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 Tyson and, and sort of these larger themes. Carrot um, top. Destroy, destroying <laughs> carrot top and destroying multiple nice cars. So it's kind of an elevated, you know, in the same way that Indiana Jones is an elevated uh, 50s adventure serial film. Right. It just takes it to a new place. And the hangover is maybe sort of the pinnacle of achievement for a bro comedy. And it was the highest grossing R rated movie at the time and held that record for a good long time. Yeah, something like five hundred million dollars. Yeah. So definitely people responded to it. Um I was resistant to it. I wasn't particularly resistant to it when you said it was your favorite. I just kinda laughed it off. But then I, you forced me to critically examine it. And I, in doing so, I was pretty con convinced and I was frankly a little bit worried about how you would handle a less than rating if I put it under the line. So are you preparing me for a whatever? Do you need to be prepared? I mean, you're entitled to your opinion, except that you'd be an idiot. <laughs> I'm trying to gauge how well it worked. I will acknowledge that the film is only, what, nine years old? 2009. So 11 years old. And so I had to look at this movie. Does it work as a dramatic movie? Absolutely not. Some It's so partial and some things simply were not realistic. But viewed through the lens of a, of a comedy, A, a bro comedy, B, a certain type of sort of swingers, old school kind of comedy, where swingers could be comparable, also took place in Vegas on a very modest budget about these guys, uh, you know, just sort of living their lives and trying to get through it, the hangover sort of ratcheted that up to 12. And in that respect, with the audacity of some of the things that went on, as dated as they were, I'm, I'm willing to acknowledge that this movie came across as funny in some aspects. And therefore? And therefore, I would say that it clears the hurdle, but there's some wobble to that bar. Like, it's like if Alan gave it his all and cleared the th cleared the the bar. And so they had it on film and he had cleared the bar, but his man purse snagged the bar and pulled it down on top of his face. And he was screaming and rolled off the bag and they had to review the footage. And they were like, did he clear it before his man purse caught it? Why was he jumping with that anyway? But we're going to give it to him. Then yes, hangover clears the bar. It's called a satchel. It's <laughs> all right review. I'm going to get some crap for that. Um, you're totally entitled to your opinion. It does make me a little sad, but I do understand that my affinity for this film may be singular to me, especially in the sense of how much I love it and how I feel it stands, it stands up. Like, I can definitely watch this film as I have watched it dozens of times before and still thoroughly enjoy it. I mean... Do you laugh out loud? I do. I laugh Because you said the surprise, the surprise element of it is part of it. And without the surprises, how well does it hold up for someone who loves it without reserve? Well, I can't watch the title sequence or the end titles anymore, the end credits anymore, because <laughs> they, that was a one time kind of thing where you finally you get a glimpse and it takes it up even yet another notch. But I can't do it anymore because it's just it's uh, it's just too much. I'm not saying that I don't lean into the fact that this doesn't seem like the profile picture for me, but there is something undeniable about it that I really, really love. So it's a clear good. That's an easy review for me. So we watched it and there's not a lot of talking afterwards. I let a few hours go and go by. And so we're brushing our teeth and Kelly, she's got her toothbrush in her mouth and she's like, so was that a real penis? <laughs> Kelly, it was very clearly a prosthetic penis, but the woman is an old ex porn actress. Ugh. All right. So you heard it from Wes, a barely clearing the bar, all right. And from Iris, a clear and present good. 
The Hangover still stands as one of my favorite movies of all time. I would love to know what you think about it. 818-835-0473 is our hotline. Leave us a voicemail, our email address, or whatever movies at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time. Are you a fan of classic cinema or a young person who wants to discover the best films of all time? Do these legendary movies still hold up? On the Generation Film Podcast, two guys who grew up when movies dominated the culture share a great film with a panel of young movie lovers and see how it plays for today's generation. We discuss changes in storytelling styles, representation, and the making of each film, its initial reception, and how its meaning has changed over the years. Join us as we explore cinema classics across generations on Generation Film. Electric acid. Step inside the marketing mirror to uncover marketing secrets, discover gems, tactics, lessons, and campaigns you can use, next gen or fundamentals. Grab the marketing magic to improve your marketing and win more business. Electric acid. Electric acid.